Hello, friends. Welcome to another episode of the Roto World Football Podcast. My name is Josh Norris here, joined by Ian Harditz. Ian, it is like 85 to 125 degrees outside. Thought it was early October. What the hell is going on today? I need hoodie weather, and I need it now. This, <laughs> this is getting ridiculous, man. We're like walking into the office and just sweating. Like sweating before you even start work is the absolute worst possible thing to start the day. I walk home most days from work. It's like a mile walk back, not too bad. And like, I struggle to get home not sweating when it's 7 p.m. and like 60. So today was just brutal. Didn't, we, we talked about this in the newsroom. You do walk home, even though I mentioned that you could take the shuttle to the train station and then walk from the train station home. The other, the other part of this though, Ian, is last week, it was like Tuesday or Wednesday, maybe even Thursday, all the days run together during the NFL season. And as soon as you left, it was an absolute <laughs> downpour, like a monsoon. Were you stuck in it? Did you just walk in it? I got caught in that monsoon. I was about maybe 30 feet away from McDonald's when it came. And look, like I think umbrellas in general are a sign of weakness. I'm a not an umbrella guy. Like it's just water. I've, I've had that stance <laughs> for a long time. But with that said, when I was out there, I was like, oh crap, I got two laptops in my backpack. This is not ideal. So because of the laptops, I had to get inside. But usually it's just rain. Anti-umbrella. Anti-umbrella. Don't need them. I, I feel like we need to dive down this path, but that'll take up too much of the podcast. Why not just, you know, shield your face and your head and your body from from rain and water and just bring an umbrella in your book back? Never mind. Well, well maybe you learn that when you're 28. All right. Uh, today's episode is a loaded one. Um, we will start off with the Thursday night football matchup, which is the Los Angeles Rams and the Seattle Seahawks. Then we'll go into another one of Ian's columns, not the injury dashboard. No, this week we're taking stock of all 32 NFL backfields. Not hitting on all 32 here, but in your column you do, maybe mm -hmm. five or six today. And then as always on this Wednesday slash Thursday episode, we bring in Nick Menzio for his bold starts and sits. But again, let's start with that great Thursday night game. The Rams at the Seahawks. The Seahawks at home are favored by one and a half, a over under of 49. Um, these are two teams that are, I believe, both three and one. They've done it in different ways. Um, are both these teams kind of who you expected at this point in the season? To an extent, I think the Rams have been almost the worst case version of what we expected, which speaks to how high their floor is still with you know, their defense and everything McVay's still able to do. But this offensive line just hasn't been the group of world beaters they were last season. And we've kind of seen that uh, reflected in Goff's pressure rate and in just kind of Gurley and Brown's ability to run the ball. I mean, last year they set, literally set the football outsiders record for most adjusted line yards per rush. And this year they're seventh in the league, but that's still a full 0 0.69 yards below what they were last season. So. Those losses in the interior have shown up, and they just haven't been able to rebound so far. For the Seahawks, I'm still trying to figure this out because I do like their offense, but at the same time, on defense, let's see, they faced Andy Dalton. They had back-to-back -back games where they knocked out Breeze and uh, Roethlisberger, right. so they got to face unprepared backup quarterbacks. And then last week, they faced Kyler Murray, who I think has underwhelmed us all uh, to this point in the season. So really haven't been tested yet, and maybe they won't this week against golf. Who knows? Focusing on the Rams... I don't think that Jared Goff has played any worse this season, just based on his down-to-down, drive-to-drive, game-to-game performances, because this is who he is. He's just not good against pressure. He's not someone who wins outside of structure. And Rich Rebar pointed out that he's been pressured on 43% of his dropbacks in 2019. Sheesh. That's the fourth highest rate. Compare that to last year in 2018, which is 32%. That was the 26th highest rate. And I think we can point to it being the massive changes along the offensive line, right? Roger Saffold, John Sullivan, Andrew Whitworth possibly declining because he's so old. Um, but the other part of that, and Cleve T.A. pointed this out on Twitter, their first down success has been a lot worse this season. Hmm. Maybe part of that is Todd Gurley being now what Todd Gurley is, um, not establishing the run, <laughs> which Sean McVay loves to do. I mean, it's a major part of his game. But what that is causing is longer yards to be attained, be needed on third down. Makes them more predictable. It allows this team that the Patriots put a blueprint out against, the Lions put a blueprint out against. How you mess up the offensive line blocking, how you mess up Jared Goff on the interior, and that's been coming back to bite them on third downs. And I'm not sure when the point it is that they can overcome that unless they can mold and mesh along that offensive line even more. Yeah, I was trying to figure out kind of what was going on with Goff ahead of last week. And one thing that stuck out to me was that his deep ball rate also took a pretty steep hit from what we saw last season. I mean, 
going into last week, I think he was like the second, had the second fewest percentage of his attempts in the league that were going 20 plus yards downfield. And, you know, this is a shot play offense. They'd like to take chances. And I do think they can start to turn things around because we did see signs of that coming back into the fold last week against the Buccaneers. Look, he's not going to throw 68 passes every week. That's tied for the third most in a game ever. It was a wild week. I mean, the Rams went down slightly because of golf, mm -hmm. down 21 nothing. And instead of, you know, trying to keep some balance, Sean McVay completely, you know, got rid of the running game. Yeah. Just threw it out <laughs> the window. I, what, Todd Gurley had 16 <laughs> rushing yards last week, which was the fewest in a regular season game since his rookie debut in 2015. It is funny, though, because that's kind of how we all play Madden. We all play video <laughs> games that as soon as you go down by a lot of points, you just throw in every single snap. And Sean McVay did it. It was mixed success. I mean, Jared Goff still made some great throws. But when you're throwing at that volume, that's not exactly the offense that you want to run. For sure, but I'm just saying, like, with that volume, some of the more specific passes were good to see. He missed Brandon Cooks on, like, a, what would have been a bomb 45-yard touchdown, unfortunate, but they really got Robert Woods going again in that intermediate area of the field after he had a cuff, uh, tough couple weeks. And even Todd Gurley. I mean, look, he didn't have a good day running the ball, but how about that receiving usage? Seven yep. catches, 54 yards. I mean, he had a probably would have been a 30-yard touchdown off a wheel route where the defender just had to grab him and get a pass interference penalty because he was beat. So I think just having that downfield threat is going to help alleviate some of that pressure at the line of scrimmage that they're facing right now. We are getting Jared Goff on the road. He's been a quarterback one, top 12 scoring quarterback just once on the road since the start of the 2018 season. Uh, speaking of volume, on the Seahawks side, Chris Carson got it last week. Chris Carson, after what, two or three fumbles in the previous two or three weeks, uh, just saw a massive amount of trust from the Seahawks against the Arizona Cardinals. It was a great spot, and he saw 48 snaps, posting 145 yards from scrimmage, made 11 people miss on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, we don't know. It kind of seems like Rashad Penny is going to play more in this game, or at least be healthy enough in this game. But I think we're already over that hump now with Chris Carson, and if there was ever going to be a loss of trust on Pete Carroll's side, then we've already passed that, and he's still going to be, to me, an established player and really the bell cow of this offense. The question is what happens with Rashad Penny probably back this week. And I agree with you. I don't think we're going to see a situation where Carson is just completely delegated to the bench or anything, especially when we have, I mean, like, look, he played so well last week. It was I mean, amazing. You said 11 broken tackles. I mean, I saw Sports Info Solutions saying he broke their record for most uh, oh. broken tackles in a week. So truly just great performance, and he did have that high 76% snap rate. What Penny does give them, though, is at least another guy they can run in between the tackles. We've seen C.J. Procise struggle to stay, stay healthy over the years. Clearly, they weren't willing to do that and give him a kind of a featured run game role even during Carson's struggles. So I could see a situation where that snap rate drops to more of a 60-40 type split, but I still think we can assume that Carson's going to get 15 to 20 touches more weeks than not. Let's close out this Thursday night preview with DK Metcalf. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a player who is an uber athlete, a ridiculous athlete, and Seattle is using him just how Ole Miss used him. Everything, almost 95% of his routes are on the left side. He, they're all based on this vertical streak, this vertical plane, this vertical line, and he's mainly being heavily featured in the red zone. Um, and he's their go-to player really in that area. A lot of it hasn't come into fruition. They love using him in the slot with Will Disley on the outside and allowing him to use a slot fade and just, again, go up and win one-on-one -on -one because of that athleticism. But I am nervous, and one, because of the volume of the passing game, and two, because Tyler Lockett's just superior to him, that I don't think we can rely on DK Metcalf as a weekly starter in fantasy football just because the volume and the consistency is not there despite the touchdown upside being there and the big playability being there. Can't necessarily rely on him for weekly consistency, but I mean, last week he had a dud. It was one catch, six yards, no touchdown. Correct. Sure. Before that, he had at least 60 yards in every game. So this was the low stretch. And like he said, he's getting the most fantasy friendly target share possible right now. I mean, ESPN's Mike Clay, good stat. Him and Kenny Galladay are tied for with a league high seven end zone targets this season. And, you know, you throw in the average target depth that's well over 20 yards. And the guy is getting nothing but deep balls and red zone attempts, which is fantastic to see. Lockett's always going to be the most consistent receiver in his offense. Like you said, he is better, more high percentage looks out of the slot. But, I mean, if you want a streamer option to throw up a wide receiver, sure. like Metcalf is best case because he gives you that ceiling that's going to get there. And real quick. How good is Russell Wilson He's playing awesome. this year? I mean, career-high marks and 
adjusted yards per attempt, completion rate, QB rating, QBR. It's crazy. He's top five in all those. You know, we all kind of expected some sort of a drop off this year and still doesn't have the volume that we'd like to see a quarterback with these type of numbers have, but the guy is playing so well. He's turning Will Disley into George Kittle. That's what he's doing. <laughs> and good on the Seahawks for using DK Metcalf where he wins, right? Yeah. Like, you're not asking him to play all of the formation. You're literally asking him to line up, perfect one release, one stance, one side of the footwork, and then allowing him just to do what he wins. And look, maybe he doesn't improve in year one. Maybe he doesn't improve in year two. Maybe he never improves, but at least you know what you get in this area of the field for him. All right, in one of your 17 signature columns each week <laughs> is taking stock of all 32 NFL backfields. Uh, we know who the workhorses are, right? And Christian McCaffrey, Ezekiel Elliott, Dalvin Cook, Alvin Kamara, for everyone out there, there's our plug and play players for them. They don't have to worry about them any week, no matter what the matchup is, because the volume is going to be there. There are a lot of backfields, though, that are muddy. And we want you to clear them up for us. Uh, let's start with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, their backfield in Ronald Jones versus Peyton Barber. Yeah, so Bruce Aaron still his fourth season. This is going to be a hot hand approach. He literally said those words, and that's what we saw. We've pretty much seen that all year. Weeks one, three, and four, it's been the Rojo show. He's been the better back. Week two, Peyton Barber was really getting going, and we end up seeing, I think, seven total snaps from Ronald Jones that game. So there's still a low floor here. I don't think they've exactly broken out of that, but – with that said, three or four weeks now, Ronald Jones has been the clearly superior runner, and last week was the most extreme version of that. I mean, he had his box score wasn't anything all that incredible, but he had a 25-yard run and a 51-yard run called back on penalty. And look, I understand a lot of times big plays get called back on penalties. They happen because of the penalties. But this was like Goblin didn't quite come set, so it was an illegal shift that had nothing to do with the play. And the other one was a hold that was downfield that, you know, was kind of iffy in and of itself. So... I feel comfortable, you know, still saying that Ronald Jones had a great game, even with these penalties. And with Dare uh, kind of still sticking in that third down role where he's playing maybe 20, 30 percent snaps, not ideal, but literally had his first carry of the season last week and is not, you know, a threat in that early down work. I think the best is yet to come for Ronald Jones. Yeah, and Ronald Jones is a second year player. Ronald Jones looked absolutely atrocious as a rookie, yep. but absolutely atrocious isn't that much worse than what Peyton Barber has been most of his career, right? I mean, he is like the standard of mediocrity. Mm -hmm. So if you get more big playability, if you get more speed, if you get more um, skills in a player like Ronald Jones, then it makes sense why he's someone that might have been slow to develop. That's why you have a Peyton Barber. But now that he's hit his stride, which he definitely has, despite what the box score may or might not show, then he's definitely someone who I'm excited to watch as we move forward. And it's a more running back friendly offense. I mean, we got to be careful about writing off guys just based on, you know, their yards per carry marks and efficiency. Because like we saw with LaShawn McCoy last season, you know, pretty brutal offense for any running back to be a fancy relevant player and moves on the Chiefs. Obviously now he's balling. Not quite the same thing for Ronald Jones in Tampa Bay, but Bruce Arians has given them a better chance to succeed. Yeah, at the Saints this week, Panthers, Titans, Seahawks are next four games for the Tampa Bay Bucks. All right, let's go to the Pittsburgh Steelers backfield. James Conner was a late first, second round pick for a lot of people. Uh, that was obviously before Ben Roethlisberger went down for the rest of the season. Now, I'm not sure how much of a timeshare. Hopefully you can sort this out for us. He's with with Jalen Samuels, who in this, what, Monday night game, uh, it certainly seemed like the Steelers wanted to scheme some wildcat opportunities for Jalen Samuels out of the backfield. Yeah, it was pretty ridiculous. I mean, to start the season, we were seeing the same thing we've always seen from the Pittsburgh backfield. James Conner, whenever he was healthy, because he was banged up a lot, he was, the, he was the guy out there. I mean, Samuels was nothing more than a handcuff afterthought. That all changed Monday night. I mean, the Steelers apparently did not like what they saw from the first game and a half of the Mason Rudolph experience. And like you said, we got a ton of Jalen Samuels wildcat. And but the biggest thing, though, is that the entire offense just flowed through these two backs. We ended up with Connor seeing a 64% snap rate. Samuels was at 46%, so we're seeing the over 100% overlap there from that. Both players had 10 carries, and both players had eight targets that they caught all of because they were almost all tap passes. Right. I mean, everyone's been hating on Teddy Bridgewater's kind of lack of downfield passes this year, but pull up Mason Rudolph's next-gen stat Eliminate tap passes for fantasy football. Thank you. It should not Thank count. You. We are smart enough to figure this out. We are. That is not a reception. Behind the line of scrimmage. We have chip trackers in everyone's pads right now. Like, be, get rid of them. Behind the line of scrimmage reception should just not count as a full point. Oh, that's yeah. a lot of screens. Yeah. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> but here's the thing. B both these running Nine backs. Nine Hines would have no points. <laughs> <laughs> if we can assume 15-plus touches a week for both Connor and Samuels, like, that's going to be productive. 
I'm hesitant to do that, and I think this is looking more like a Denver Cincy two-back committee where, yeah, the guys are talented enough to have good weeks, but they're still operating in what has all the signs of being a below-average uh, offense. I would not anticipate this being a Kansas City-type situation where both guys are going to be super high-end RB2s every week. Yeah, and we know that a lot of teams run more when they win, right? Mm -hmm. It's not they win because they run more. Are you sure? Uh, yeah. So here with the Steelers, they haven't shown us a lot to make us believe they're going to be winning in a lot of games. Exactly. So maybe the volume just goes down considerably for both. And that's, that's very concerning with a team you wouldn't have expected that from uh, prior to the start of the season. All right, the team that will be in the lead a lot is the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, it's a loaded backfield, though. First, it was Damian Williams to start the season. All offseason, we heard that, oh, yeah, when he comes back and he's healthy, he's going to be our guy. Well, he's injured again. And he's now mainly out of the equation. Uh, you have LaShawn McCoy, uh, who has seen a good amount of volume, but has also been banged up. And then you have Darrell Williams, who is seeing the goal line work and the touchdowns because of it. I don't know if I'll go as far as to say that this is a three-headed backfield, but it's actually a backfield that we want exposure to because it's tied to the best quarterback and the best passing game in the NFL. Yeah, and I really do think we see this go back to a two-RB backfield once Damian's healthy because that's been the one constant here. We have not seen Andy Reid be willing to make this a three-headed committee at this point. Weeks one and two, it was only Damian, it was only Shady. Weeks three and four, it was only Daryl, only Shady. I mean, Darren Thompson is just completely benched, and Daryl Williams was completely benched in weeks one and two. So, uh, yes, Daryl got the goal line carries. It seemed to me more like a week one Rams situation where I think he got the carries because he was on the field, not necessarily because they wanted to yank Shady off. Got it. I mean, they gave Shady three carries inside the five-yard line in one stretch and let him pound it in eventually. So I think they're fine with Shady early downs. I think the actual issue is on passing downs. We've seen Damian and Daryl work ahead of Shady in terms of targets and in terms of uh, – just pass blocking routes, which when you think about how complicated the Chiefs offense is, especially with the running backs in the passing game, all those crazy screens, uh, reads devising and all this, Shady's, ca Shady's a capable receiver. He can do all this, but if there was an area that he might be slow to pick up on, it's not surprising to me that's the passing game. What are your feelings on how LaShawn McCoy carries the football in the open field? I love it. I can't get enough of it. I love it, too. I mean, it's incredible. I was looking. I don't think he's fumbled since uh, 2017 because he, he had three or four runs a Sunday where it was just – patented shady he carries it like a, like a loaf of bread roll of toilet paper out there yeah like just one-handed palming the ball um yeah i mean the game's slowing down for him like that's what i love to see people that like just look different that run different that play different and LaShawn mccoy is definitely one of those at the backfield averaging his most yards per touch since 2013 and to your point with a three-headed backfield i mean maybe only kyle shanahan knows how to use a three-person backfield <laughs> in the nfl to like a good degree yeah. to a good outcome. So I wouldn't expect the Kansas City Chiefs to be able to do it. All right, the Los Angeles Chargers, Melvin Gordon is back. Melvin Gordon returned last week, but he did not play against the Miami Dolphins because, you know, the Chargers could have tried out nine players and would have won that game. <laughs> uh, but we have seen Austin Eckler be absolute di absolutely dynamite this year. He's been dynamic. He's been fantastic. He's been one of the best running backs across fantasy football. So what's your read now with Austin Eckler's value with Melvin Gordon and also his value returning to the field? So I think Melvin Gordon is going to come back into this RB1 role. He played last season when he was healthy. He played 70% or more snaps in eight of nine games that he was fully healthy for. Had some injuries at the end of the year he was playing through and obviously left a few games early. But when he has been healthy and active and willing to play football, Melvin Gordon has been their bell cow. With that said, Eckler has never really taken a fullback seat, and especially with Justin Jackson sideline with his calf injury. I think there's still a good chance Eckler could flirt with a 40 or 50 percent snap rate because he offers the type of skill set where you can play two running backs on the field at the same time. And we talked about some of these running backs that most of their passes, you know, come on tap passes or screens and all this. That's not Austin Eckler. I mean, he had a play against the Lions, if you remember, where lined up as a pure wide receiver and he's running a double move on a freaking safety, getting open down the field. So five catches every game this season. Mike Williams was out last week with a back injury. Travis Benjamin was out with a quad injury. These guys are banged up at wide receiver, and Eckler offers that receiving ability to help there. And he's just, he's great. Like you're saying, he's killing it. I don't think they want to necessarily pull him off the field if right. they can avoid it. I'm not stating my opinion here, just posing a question. Uh, with all of the offensive line issues that the Chargers still have and are kind of overcoming so far, so far this season, um, is it possible that the Chargers offense is better with Austin Eckler on the field than Melvin Gordon in 2019? It's possible just because I think you would say then like the play calling just more pass heavy, you know, more emphasis on the running back targets and just more efficient in general. But I do think Melvin Gordon, I mean, 
I understand Eckler has a superior yards per touch, yards per carry. He's been the more efficient runner, but something needs to be said for a guy like Melvin who does it over a longer stretch, who you know does have that tackle-breaking ability and can usually hold up over the course of an entire season. So to me, it's kind of like basketball where you know we shouldn't assume just because a guy shoots 40% from three on eight attempts per game that if you jack up the attempts to 16 that he's going to keep shooting 40%. So Eckler, don't get me wrong, he can be a feature back at a high level, but I think Melvin Gordon having a player that good on the field is still going to be good for just about any offense. Once again, that was taking stock of all 32 backfields. Ian's column is still up on Roto World right now. And now we bring on Nick Minzio with his bold starts and sits of the weekend. I've got all these four names, Nick, and yes, they are definitely bold. Let's start off with Houston Texans wide receiver Will Fuller against the Atlanta Falcons this week. You have him as a start, Nick. That's despite just 23 targets, 14 receptions, and 183 yards through four games so far this season. Yeah, I mean, counting stats haven't been there for four yet, but he's 12th in the NFL in air yards. Um, like you said, it's just 183 real life the show for that with zero touchdowns i mean something's got to give here soon with him he, he's seeing consistent targets with seven seven and six the last three weeks after seeing two in the opener but he's faced three legit secondaries in the jaguars chargers and panthers the last three weeks um he was tackled at the three yard line two weeks ago had a would-be 75 yard touchdown slightly overthrown and golf his fingertips last week um I'm just, I'm just expecting a big game here soon i'd prefer to be in front of it rather than reacting to it you know what i mean but the Falcons are 21st in pass defense DVOA, 20th in fantasy points allowed to receivers. Uh, DeAndre Hopkins should see a ton of Desmond True find this spot, so that leaves Florida to work on uh, first-year starter Isaiah Oliver. Um, Oliver ran 4-5 flat coming out of Colorado. Um, Will Fuller has a distinct speed advantage in this one. as a 4-3-2-40 coming out, come out in 2016. Um, Oliver has surrendered 13 yards per catch in his coverage this season so far a 127.6 passer rating and three touchdowns. Um, Houston's implied team total of 27 is fourth highest on the board. So there's a lot of things pointing in Fuller's favor this week. Yeah, Nick, I'm with you on the spot, on the air yards, on the just, you know, that ball last week should have been a 75-yard touchdown. We wouldn't even be worrying about whether the starter set him. And the other thing I think that people could be missing here is Kenny Stills with that hamstring is probably not going to be active, assuming he won't. We'll see how the practice practice participation is if we're putting Kiki Kute in there he's going to not be running the same route so that's going to be more underneath targets uh -huh. which could feasibly lead to more downfield looks for Fuller right yeah I like that I like that where, you're, where your head's at with that one I like that thought use that one for the column Nick that's a little <laughs> extra work that you don't have to do uh, all right your next your next start is David Montgomery the rookie running back with the Chicago Bears going against the Oakland Raiders uh, four games for David Montgomery only 58 carries a clean 200 yards and one touchdown. He has gotten a little bit involved in the passing game, 12 targets, eight receptions for 61 yards. But Nick, his workload has been growing and his snap share has been growing as the season has progressed. Yeah, after playing 38% of the snaps week one, seeing seven touches in that opener against the Packers, Montgomery's been on in on 60.1% of the downs the past three weeks. Touch counts of 19, 16, and 24 in that span. Um, Tariq Cohen has touched counts of six, six, and seven, while Mike Davis has played a total of 16 snaps and zero last week in that. So Davis has been phased out of the offense completely. Montgomery's taking a bigger piece of the pie. Um, like with Fuller, I'm expecting a breakout game here sooner than later. Um, Montgomery enters this one as RB35. But, I mean, this it's time to start locking Montgomery into fantasy lineups as an every week RB2 with outside. I mean, the Raiders have been pretty solid against the run. Um, number nine in run defense, DVOA, 14th. And fantasy points allowed to running backs. They shut down Marlon Mack last week. But Dalvin Cook and Alexander, Mal Alexander Madison um, had a ton of success in week three against them, combining for 168 yards and two touchdowns on 28 carries. Um, I just expect, with, with Mitchell Tubrisky out with the shoulder injury, I just expect this offense to lean more on Montgomery especially against a, a, a Raiders team that should be as five-and-a-half-point favorites. Um, the Raiders also lost Fontes perfect to suspension, so that helps Montgomery's cause a little bit. So I'm just expecting a bigger game here um, and better efficiency from Montgomery moving forward. Nick, you kind of glossed over it, so I want to you know, highlight this point once again. Um, David Montgomery will now be attached to Chase Daniel, and you're not frightened right. by that. No, I mean, I, I, I just thought you should be honest. I, I'm the volume in the spot against a defense that I don't think is as good as 
Cool. All right. The sit first one is on the opposite side of this, actually. Uh, the other running back, the other rookie running back, and Josh Jacobs against that vaunted Bears defense, which has definitely been sticky year to year, I might point out. Uh, four games for Josh Jacobs so far this year. 62 carries, 370 yards, and two touchdowns. Five targets, only three receptions for 57 yards. Nick, when I watch Josh Jacobs, I see maybe the best rookie in the NFL. Like, he's been absolutely fantastic. He's been wonderful. He's breaking tackles. He's creating yards on his own. He just needs more opportunities. But you're a little bit worried, obviously, because of the Bears' defense. Yeah. I mean, if, if the Raiders fall behind, he just doesn't play as much. In the two losses, he has touch counts of 10 and 12. I mean, that's obviously a game plus dependent. I mean, if the Raiders are winning, he's obviously going to get the ball more. But they come into this into this game as five-and-a-half-point road underdogs in London. Um Jacobs hasn't scored since week one. He's not running many pass routes. He caught his first two balls, first two balls of the season since week one last week. Um, Coach John Gruden keeps talking up how he wants to um, elevate his usage in the pass game, but he only ran 13 routes last week, and that falls right in line with his 11.25 average for the season. Um, the Bears are—they're just their defense is just too good. I mean, they're. They're number, they're top five in, in run defense DVOA. They're top five in fancy points allowed in running backs, and that's even missing um, Akeem Hicks in the middle last week. They they held Dalvin Cook to 35 yards on 14 carries. Cook fell into the end of for a short touchdown, so that's obviously a plus. But in, in losses for the Raiders, Jacobs is, has finished fantasy finishes of RB 26 and RB 44. So, I mean, the Raiders have to win games for him to be usable in fantasy for me, and it just doesn't look like this is a spot that's going to be really conducive to fantasy success as a 40.5-point total, the lowest of the week. Um, the Raiders' implied team total of 17.75 is third lowest of the week. So, he was just hoping for a touchdown with Jacobs in this spot. Yeah, Nick, definitely with you on terrible spot. I think we all know that. And even last week when things did work out great, the Raiders inexplicably got a two-touchdown lead by the second quarter. Jacobs only ended up with 17 rush attempts and two receptions. I mean, those aren't bad numbers, but for a guy that we were expecting to be a three-down bell cow more weeks than not, I mean, we just can't hang our hat on that type of usage if that's in a best-case scenario in the spot, right? Absolutely. Absolutely agree with everything you said there. I, I just don't get it. And look, I'm not a football coach, and John Gruden will know way more about football than I ever will. I just do not get limiting one of your best offensive players and not trying to feature him. I, I wonder if the illness thing is still an issue. Possibly. He said he lost 10 pounds two weeks ago, but he wasn't on the report last week. So. Possibly, but I would even say that this has been the case since week one. Yeah. Like, Josh Jacobs, Darren Waller's good. Tyrell Williams is good. Josh Jacobs is the best player on the Raiders offense if you're watching these games. And he's making plays in the passing game when given these opportunities. I think his receptions went for 10, 19, and 28 yards. Ooh. And they're just not getting him involved. It's utterly ridiculous, Nick. And I don't understand it when you have a lack of playmakers, a lack of talent, and you refuse to use your most talented player. Yeah, I mean, all they have is Tyrell Williams and, and Darren Waller in the pass game, but they're still not giving the ball to Jacobs, and that's fine. I mean, perhaps if, if Williams sits out this week, he has a foot injury popped up on the injury report um, this week with a new issue. He's been battling a hip issue the past couple weeks, has a foot problem now. Didn't practice Wednesday, so perhaps if he sits, we'll see a little more Jacobs in the pass game, but I'm with you. They need to start getting the ball in his hands more. Let's close out with another sit. That is DJ Shark, the wide receiver for the Jacksonville Jaguars, who has a tremendous rapport with Gardner Minshew. Uh, he's facing the Carolina Panthers Nick, this week in four games for Shark, 26 targets, 19 receptions, 321 yards, and three touchdowns. I mean, this is a player last year that was drafted in the second round that was deemed, I mean, word for word, this is what the Jaguars said after drafting him. Well, we like how fast he runs down the field, and that'll open it up for Leonard Fournette underneath him. All right, DJ Shark's a better football player than Leonard Fournette is right now. <laughs> and what he's doing is making these wild, ridiculous, acrobatic catches from Gardner Minshew um, but you're nervous because this Panthers defense has remained a very, very good unit despite losing K1 short, and a lot of it is because of James Bradbury on the outside. They yeah, absolutely have been James Bradbury on the outside is, is the main I'm trying to fade in this spot. I mean, he's the wide receiver overall, overall wide receiver eight, which surprised me to this point. He had touchdowns in the first two games. Had a touchdown called back last week on a penalty. Um, leads the Jaguars in air yards, has – is obviously Gardner Minshew's favorite target with touch, uh, target counts of 9, 5, and 8 in his three starts. But like you said, Bradbury's size, 6'4", 
six one two twelve long arms on the outside plus that plus athleticism seventeen cover corner out of one hundred and seven qualifier qualifiers today all right Nick. hey sorry Nick uh, we just lost you a little bit there um, but I think we got a gist of what you're saying if you want to read the full thing you can go and check that out in Nick's start sit column um, Ian any thoughts on DJ Shark as we close up this podcast yeah only thing I'd add it is a tough matchup and also this is still a run first offense that Shark hasn't necessarily pulled away from and just raw tar- target show he's getting the downfield and red zone looks which is great we talked about that with Metcalf but he has 26 targets with Minshew under center. D.D. Westbrook has 26 targets. Fournette has 23. Conley has 19. Their two tight ends have 30. Minshew is using that kind of air raid philosophy of spreading the ball around this year. Chark has easily been the best receiver, but might not be a situation where we see enough targets week to week. All right, that'll wrap it up for this podcast. We'll be back on Thursday with another episode, this time with John Daigle, Hayden Winks, and Patrick Doherty. I'm finally getting these names down. Finally getting the <laughs> schedule down. We're almost done with, like, week five. Isn't it wild? Keep it rolling. Almost a third of the way done with the season. Like you said, keep it rolling is the correct way of putting that. Ian Harditz, again, go check out his injury dashboard and taking stock of all 32 NFL backfields. We'll be back tomorrow. See ya.